Welcome into the Nike Hot Seat. I'm Emily Eman chatting with some of our Nike volleyball athletes across the world to highlight the ones who make this sport so great. Today, I'm joined by one of the greatest of them all, Jordan Larson, member of Team USA since 2009, been a captain since 2017, and of course, the biggest of them all, Olympic gold medalist from Tokyo, where you were named the MVP of that tournament. Jordan, I want to kick it off and, and kind of go back. You grew up in probably the biggest volleyball hotbed in the entire U.S. in Nebraska. I'm wondering, what's your earliest memory of playing volleyball? Oh my gosh. Uh, actually, I was just talking about this with a friend. Um, my parents, uh, my mom and my stepdad actually coached me in the YMCA, like I think it was eight, you know, and I remember my knee pads being bigger than my thighs. Um, that was, <laughs> uh, so I just remember it was so fun. Like obviously being like um, coached by my parents was awesome and um, just learning the sport. Um, but I was lucky that I was able to play multi-sports like as I was growing up, which I think helped me even fall in love with with volleyball that much more. What made you pick volleyball over those other sports? Um, well, soccer, I was like, I, the fact that I had to play outside and elements, I was like, no, that's a no. And so much running. Same with basketball. I, I still, I love basketball, but it was just a lot of running and too much contact for me. Uh, volleyball, I love that you, you needed a lot of pieces to win, you know, and um, the team aspect and there's so much to, to learn about it. Um, excuse me. And then I also played softball as well, but, you know, obviously being out in the elements too was not ideal and something that I really wanted to participate in, but I, I'm, I'm very grateful that I grew up in a place that was small enough that I could do pretty much everything and really like experiment and also kind of give my mind a rest from other sports. So, um, yeah, it was good. <clears throat> at what age did you start to realize that you were pretty good at it? Um, you know, I think, uh, my, both my parents were athletes and I think I was just always like very athletic, you know, like I still remember like they had like a punt passing kick like contest in like eighth grade and like I beat all the boys like I just was like and I was always at recess like hanging with the guys like playing football and like just outside a lot and I am grateful for that because I think it just allowed me to like be able to adapt and adjust in the sport um, and I think I, I just was able to maybe not read the game that well at a young age, but make athletic moves that maybe not normal, um, maybe normal athletes could make. And so I think I, I think from, you know, eighth grade on, like, I really realized that maybe this is something that I would be really good at and, and could do long-term. And growing at a, up in a place like Nebraska, obviously, again, such a volleyball hotbed. To those who might not be that aware of it, how would you explain the importance of volleyball to the state of Nebraska? Yeah. Oh, gosh. How to articulate that? I mean, I think when I was growing up, right, like Nebraska football at the time and the volleyball, too, was kind of coming on its own. But Nebraska football was so well known, right? Like the Tom Osborne era and like, you know, winning national championships and stuff like that in 95 and um and then volleyball really has kind of taken on this new head. And now like there's t-shirts going around of like Nebraska, like a volleyball state, you know, and like, it's so cool to see just, I think also too, like, like elevating women in sport, um, how it's just really elevated across, uh, obviously across the United States, but especially in Nebraska as well. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's really sometimes hard to explain until like, obviously I know growing up there, what it was like and and what it was like to, be a hometown girl, like, and playing in the home state, like what that meant for me, but then really trying to explain that girls like were coming in from, excuse me, from out of state, like what that actually, like what it meant to be at Nebraska and, and there's no professional sports, right. in in Nebraska. And so, you know, semi-pro those kind of things, but so you're really at the university, you're really looked at as like, you know, um, icons of like younger athletes that are growing up and dreaming big of wanting to be like quote unquote on a bigger stage and so um it's just a different um weight of what it means and yeah just how proud um a lot of people are to watch it across the state it's hard to understate the importance of volleyball to the entire exactly. state and and you went on to play at nebraska you were a two-time first team all-american won a national title in 2006 looking back what impact did playing at Nebraska have on your career? Um, yeah, I think obviously, gosh, it gives me chills, like thinking about it, like just some of the greatest years of my life. And 
Um, I think for me, having my family in the stands was huge, you know, only being an hour from home. And, but then also I think because we play in such a big crowd always, like at the time we were playing at the Coliseum. So Max was a little under 3000, which at the time is like huge, but like sold out, you know, and loud. And um, I think being able to perform in front of that automatically kind of set me up for success, you know, when I got into arenas, like when I was in Brazil and like, it's a sold out crowd of like 10,000, you know, and, or in Japan where we're playing in front of like all these, you know, Japanese fans with like thunder sticks, you know, like when you're having all this noise, you have to learn how to focus in and be like, all right, I feel all this going around, but how can I still be good and what's going on? And so um, it really helps kind of set a stage of, dealing with distraction and performing at a high level. Cause obviously too, the, I would say the expectation, right. When you're, I remember coming in as a freshman, we were already number one. And so it was like, you're coming in at just such a high level that you're forced to be operating at a high level. Like you have no other choice. Otherwise you're not going to be able to play or continue on down the road. So um, yeah, I, I feel very, very grateful for that, that I started off like really, really well. I've definitely been a part of the, some of those massive crowds at now the Devaney Center, but there is truly nothing like it. And for you, you mentioned how that set up, um, you know, you able to play in these other countries and to have those fans be crazy. You've played all over the world, you know, Russia, Turkey, China, you're now in Italy. Of all the places and cities that volleyball has taken you, where has been your favorite? Um, I always have a special place. I've never actually played professionally in Japan, but with the national team, we travel often there. And I just, I love the people. I love uh, the culture part of it. There's a Starbucks on every corner. So that <laughs> just is like a little taste of home when you're away. Um, but yeah, I just, I really like that. And obviously like the crowds are amazing. They just love good volleyball too, which I would equate, you know, it was nice feeling at home in that sense, because I feel like Nebraska fans just love good volleyball too, right? Obviously their, their pride and joy is the Huskers, but like, if there's like a really nice rally, they, they're going to cheer. Like, even if Nebraska doesn't win, they're going to cheer because of it. So I love that about Japanese fans as well. And just the country is amazing. So, um, but professionally, I would say, gosh, some of the most beautiful cities I've played in Shanghai um, and then obviously Istanbul. And now I'm in Italy. It's, I mean, I've just been very blessed to be in some of the best places. So all right, way more importantly, who has the best food? <sighs> I feel like Italy takes the cake for sure. <laughs> I mean, it is. It, and it's just so wholesome. Like the, you can tell the quality is just so high and like more natural and not a ton of stuff in it. So it's it's been really, really cool. But you've been around the world, played in so many different places and honestly, won more medals and accolades than I can even count. The biggest thing I always wonder with elite athletes that are, you know, at the top of their sport, where do you keep all the hardware? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Some days I'm like, I, you know, I'm like going through some stuff. I'm like, oh, I forgot about this. You know, it's like, uh, there's some places that I just keep at home. And then obviously like uh, my medals, I keep in the safety deposit box and make sure those are safe, especially sometimes I have to do events though, where they're like, can you bring it? And so it's just, I always try to keep it on me and wherever I'm at, just make sure it's on me. So, um, but it's hard because you want to display it too. It's like, there's no cool place to like, how do you display like some of the greatest joy, like memorabilia of your life, you know, it's hard to do that um, and do it right. So, yeah. Does the Olympic gold medal, does that kind of travel with you all the, all around? You want to keep that one close? Yeah, no, it's still, it's still at home, but I definitely do travel around with it more. And that's probably the one that people want to see the most. Um, so yeah, it's still so surreal to me. <laughs> well, I've mentioned you've been a captain of team USA since 2017, which year or maybe time of your career helped you develop most as a leader? Yeah, goodness. Um, I, I just, I feel very lucky that like, I mean, I think even just our national team, like the success over time, right? They, we've been so good for a long time and so many wonderful leaders have come along the way in front of me. And how how can I learn, you know, what makes them good at what they're doing? And then how could I be better? And I think one of the biggest lessons that I've learned that I'm still striving to get better at is I, I have to get to know my teammates off the court. I have to get to know them and kind of what makes them tick and and why they are the way they are and really spend that quality time because if I want to hold them accountable on the court, then I have to have some rapport off the court and let them know that like, it, you know, me 
setting a standard in practice is coming from a place of caring and wanting to win and not because of anything else. You know, I, I love them and I love who they are and what they bring to the game. And there's this mutual respect. And so I think that's been the biggest lesson that I've um, had to learn over the years, but I feel very grateful that I've had so many great examples come before me um, to like really understand how that looks and, but it's different for everybody, right? Like I'm not going to be like a Krista Harmato, a Jen Thomas, um, a Daniel Scott, you know, like those, they're, they're just different and everybody leads in their own way. And how can I still be authentic to who I am? Um, but kind of bring a side of that, uh, of them to, to the table as well. If you could point to one or two people, who do you think has had the biggest influence on you in developing as a leader? <clears throat> oh, that's a great question. Oh, I, I've had a lot of great coaches, obviously. And I think like Karch has done such a great job. Um, I think he's really preached like culture and learning how to work as a team and that, you know, you can have talent, but, you know, ultimately the culture side is huge. And obviously he was a great player and like learning from him um, and just asking questions. Um, and he just cares so much, like obviously about USA Volleyball, but like us as, in, as people and uh, they don't forget that. And I think having and learning from him helped me like kind of really navigate that space on like how I wanted to be best. And then obviously I think as of late, um, really getting to know Sue Inquest has been awesome. She um, was, she doesn't want to be called, she's our team consultant um, for leading into, um, into Tokyo and she's just a baller. I just, I'm so grateful for her. Like she can shoot it to you straight. And um, I think sometimes you need that in life and you need people to hold you accountable and kind of, but also give you some, some love too. Like she's just, she's been awesome and someone to have in your corner. Thinking back on your entire career from maybe the time you started playing up until now, which game do you remember feeling the most proud after? Oh my. Oh, uh, can I say two? Is that okay? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. All right. So I, I always go back to an 08 down 02 in Washington with Nebraska. Like that team on paper, like the year before we lost four all Americans, two national players of the year, like no one expected anything from us. And we, I mean, the first weekend out in the season, we go on and sweep Stanford and UCLA, I believe. And people are like, wait a minute, like this was a quote unquote, like rebuilding year, you know, but we made a choice as a team that year that like, no, like we, yes, we lost a lot, but like we can still pick up the pieces and be a sum of our parts, you know, like it is something, it was so unique. And um, I, I remember after that match, it was one of my very, one of the very first matches where I feel like I, even if we would have lost, like I know that I had given everything that I could. And I think everybody could have said the same. And that came from, you know, obviously working hard, but also like emotionally, like just exhausted. And so um, and then be able to go to the final four of just another chance to play like meant so much. And then obviously I think uh, the game in Tokyo uh, winning the gold medal. Um, do I wish it was a little more of a like exciting match per se? <laughs> I think so. But um, honestly, like how we were clinical, like, you, I mean, I don't know if there was ever a history, like the quarterfinal semifinal three zero, like, I don't think it's ever been done maybe one other time before. And, but why it was like that was because we had so much clarity around rural clarity, what, how we wanted to be, how we wanted to represent, and then to show up like that and like to finally take what I feel like USA Volleyball has deserved for so long um, is just, uh, and to think about how much work was done just off the court alone, like that, and it made all the difference. So it, to see that result really amplify would just made all the all are the more like exciting times about it so yeah it's interesting too to hear you talk about kind of the dichotomy of those two teams one being a team that wasn't supposed to do that and then ended up getting there and then yes you have that team in Tokyo that from day one was dominant the entire time it's interesting to see you know you being proud of those two moments but for completely different reasons for sure. Absolutely. But I think ultimately too, the similarities of both of them is that it boils down to culture. Like, I think I've also been on teams that have unreal talent. Like you talk about like paper, like the best, the best of the best. But when it came down to when things were tough, 
you know, it's can a team like pull on the, on the rope together or are they pulling like apart? So I just think both of those teams were pulling in the same direction and it, and I think what people don't realize is the depth and layer of like, it's almost like a love, like it's a love and respect for one another for everybody's not the same on a team, right? Which is awesome. You don't want everybody to be the same, but like, can I accept that person and love them for where they're at and like figure out how we can best function together? I think that adds just so much love and depth to, to winning. Um, and even if you lose and you gave everything you have, like, I think people would be, you know, like nobody likes to lose, but it's like, it's how you go about it and how you do it. And you feel like you do, if you've done it the right way, at the end of the day, like you can wipe your hands of it, you know? As a, a leader or a captain on some of these teams, what have you found is the best way to establish that culture really early on, maybe before the season or right when that season starts? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, we were lucky that we had Sue facilitating and I've worked with a ton of great sports psychs, uh, Mike Dravet, Ken Revisa, that are able to facilitate those conversations. But I think it's just opening the floor and like, ha like, but people have to be vulnerable. They have to be able to open themselves up and talk about their fears. Like it's okay. And it's okay to be nervous, right? Like it's okay to feel those things. It's very, very normal. But all of a sudden when you learn how to open that up and open that book and be like, hey, I need help in this moment. Like, it's okay. You can ask for that. All of a sudden it just, it breeds this, uh, layer of like, I don't know, acceptance and it's okay. But I think having those conversations early on, like lead to just a ton of clarity down the road, you know, and with like way more like one-on-one -on -one open direct conversations, which is awesome. Earlier, you mentioned how this sport has grown kind of from the time that you started playing until now. I'm wondering what's the biggest way that you've seen conversations around the sport of volleyball evolve over time? Yeah, um, I think obviously now even just professional sports now, like women professional volleyball being like brought to the United States and people are talking about it and wanting to get behind it, I think is is huge. Um, and because I think they see that like younger girl, like it's the most popular sport being played right now, you know, and, and so and I feel like there's a reason behind that. And um, I think just, yeah people wanting to get behind it and having those conversations is huge. Um, and then obviously like with NIL, you know, like places like Nebraska, I mean, people are like all over it. I think it's like the coolest thing ever. So I'm kind of jealous to be honest. I'm like, man, why, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about the future for volleyball, what would you still like to see more of, or where would you like to see volleyball five, 10 years down the line? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I guess you could use me as an example. Like I've seen that you can make this a career and make it a lifestyle, you know, and like, would it be that much cooler to be at home? Like, oh, amazing. Right. And so I think, can we find an avenue? And I think people are trying that women can stay home and be in the United States and like players from outside the United States can come and play like, and really creating like a well-known league and people wanting to play and like people wanting to watch and being on TV. Right. I remember with AU and I saw it on the TV and I was like, yeah. wait, what professional level like on TV? Like what, you know, like I would hope that that continues to grow and people start to get behind it and understand like it's fun to watch and people want to be a part of it. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And, and Jordan, thank you so much for sharing all your insight into, you know, what it takes to be a leader and a captain, some of your backstory, and then some of your thoughts on, on how this sport can still improve and move forward. Um, you are the absolute best. You are the GOAT, Jordan. Thank you so much. Thanks, Emily.